بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على الشف الأمي المنصرين وعلى آله وصحبه جعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ما بعد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد الله بارك على محمد وعلى محمد كما بركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد رب الشرح لي صدري والسر لأمني وحل العقدة من لسان قول قولي الله من فعل ما علمتنا علمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين respected brothers and elders and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala underneath uh, the rain where Allah Azza wa Jal's mercy is descending. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us into the best place in all the world. MashaAllah, the masajid. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah ta'ala that He brought us in for the best purpose as well, to listen to His remembrance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all our sins, allow us that we benefit, inshallah, allow us that we can take this message to others, inshallah ta'ala, and that He takes this gathering and makes it a means of acceptance on the Day of Judgment. Amin, Rabbil Alameen. The reason why we started these stories of the Prophets is because to correct a lot of our understandings and to hopefully, inshallah, educate ourselves. And so we reached uh, to one of the more, <coughs> one of the most uh, important Prophets, at least for our time. And it's a Prophet, mashallah, that I spent a lot of time discussing. Many uh, khutbahs have actually spoke about this Prophet already, Sayyiduna Lut alayhi salam. Along with that, we've already had a halaqa about him also. MashaAllah, I love Lut Aleyhisselam so much and named my son Lut too, you know. So having said that, MashaAllah, he's a very pro- he's a prophet who's very near and dear to my heart because of the fact that he's so important and vital. The da'wah that he gives, the way he gives it, the approach that he takes, everything about this Nabi is so f- amazing. And so I want everyone, inshallah, from this halaqah, this gathering, you know, because many times I've spoken about him. This is not the only masjid I've spoken about Lut Aleyhisselam, right? Many times I speak about him, people are very much, um, I want to say, a little under-impressed. The reason why is because people are assuming something about this Nabi that he's going to mention about some uh, maybe nature.com facts or something, some biological discussions or some things about you know trying to refute LGBT or something like that. But the job of a Nabi is much deeper than that. And this is the thing. We sometimes get caught in little conversations. Wallahi, this is a little conversation compared to what a Nabi salam is concerned with. So I want everyone, inshallah, when we discuss about it, to note that this Nabi salam is going to speak about very deep topics. And he doesn't, a Nabi, you're going to see, he's, learned, he's trained from whom? Lut alayhi salam, just to give you an idea, he is the nephew of Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam, as we all might have already known. I- Ibrahim alayhi salam's father, which is Azar, uh, they, they call him Tarakh, right? He has a son named Haran. Haran is the father of Lut alayhi salam. So Ibrahim alayhi salam and Haran are brothers. And so what, the son of Haran is Lut alayhi salam. And so wherever Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam is traveling, this is the thing. You have to recognize that whoever Ibrahim alayhi salam is traveling across the entire world, wherever he goes, there is a one boy, a young boy that's with him, which is Lut alayhi salam. That is traveling to him. Imagine when he's going to the area of Babylon, to the area of Egypt, to the area of, of Sham, wherever he's going, the one who's making hijra with him is Sayyiduna Lut alayhi salam. He's become so praiseworthy, exceptional, that the Prophet Muhammad sallam, says that the first family to make hijra, right, to make proper hijra, is Sayyiduna Lut alayhi salam. The Quran describes and extols him. He praises uh, Sayyiduna Lut Aisim greatly. When Lut Aisim said, فَآمَنَ لَهُ Lut وَقَالَ إِنِّي مُهَاجِرٌ لَا رَبِّي إِنَّهُ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Lut Aisim, the Quran is recorded to have said that Lut Aisim believed in Ibrahim Aisim and then it says, إِنِّي مُهَاجِرٌ I'm making hijra, I'm migrating إِلَى Rabbi to my Lord. إِنَّهُ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Okay? He's such a notable Nabi. And this is the thing, we have no idea how important Lut Aisim is. And so I want to make it very clear for everyone. Sayyidina Lut alayhi salam, whenever we recite the root salawat on the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you're saying Allah salli ala Muhammad wa ala ni Muhammad, Allah bless Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah send your blessings on Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Kama sallayta, the same way you sent blessings upon Ibrahim wa ala ahli Ibrahim and on Ibrahim and on the family of Ibrahim alayhi wa sallam. When you say the family of Ibrahim alayhi wa sallam, who does that include? That includes Sarah. That includes um, Hajar, that includes Ismail, that includes Ishaq alayhi salam, and it includes Sayyiduna Lut alayhi salam. By automatically. So every time you send salawat, durud, sharif ala Nabi sallallahu alayhi salam, you have in fact also send blessings upon Sayyiduna Lut alayhi salam also. This is how important he is. So vital of a person, Allah ta'ala made him a sahabi, a companion of Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam. So his suhbah is very important. He learns from the man who learned to make sacrifice for Allah ta'ala. 
Ibrahim is known to give sacrifice and his companion is Lut alayhi salam. Wherever Ibrahim alayhi salam goes, Lut alayhi salam goes too. So like, like teacher, like master, you know, is going to be like student, right? And like father, like son. Everything you're going to see that's in Ibrahim alayhi salam, you're going to find an extension in Lut alayhi salam. He's so vital, he's so precious. That's why the Quran, in I think about 14 surahs, 27 times Lut alayhi salam is mentioned. That's roughly about 10% of the Quran has a discussion about Lut alayhi salam. He is so important, subhanAllah, yet everyone here seems to have, may Allah forgive us, we have an allergy. We hear loot and we think homosexual. What, what is this? Right? It's not loot, right? It's qawmul loot, right? <laughs> SubhanAllah. And so I tell everyone, uh, we, haven't had, we had a conversation, I remember with an alim of deen. I asked him, I said that, because he studied hadith, I said, did you find any narrators of hadith that are named loot? Right, because narrators of hadith are so many, right? There's like hundreds of thousands of narrators, whatever. And I said that, have you found any uh, narrators that are named Lut? He said, no, no. I think out of all the narrators of hadith, I think he said only two people were ever named Lut. Could you imagine that? It's such a name that is so abandoned in our ummah. Subhanallah, a nabi, a rasul of Allah Ta'ala, that no one even bothers getting near this name because they have some weird allergy or some feeling towards it. May Allah Azza wa forgive us. Right, this is why subhanAllah knowing about this Nabi is very important. He's a Sahabi of Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam. The same way Yusha alayhi salam, Yusha alayhi salam was a companion of Musa alayhi salam. Because Yusha alayhi salam spent time with Musa alayhi salam, you know the whole Khidr alayhi salam incident where he traveled along with Khidr alayhi salam? There was actually three people together, right? That was Musa, Khidr and Yusha. They were actually traveling all together, three of them alayhi salam. Because he spent so much time in the company of Musa alayhi salam, Allah blesses Yusha bin Noon alayhi salam and makes him into a Nabi because of the fact that he spent so much time with the Nabi of Allah. Allah Ta'ala the same thing with Ibrahim alayhi salam because Lut alayhi salam spent so much time with Ibrahim alayhi salam Allah Ta'ala also blesses him with Nubuwa as well, prophethood. Okay? Now his job is an extro extremely important job. His job is an extremely important job. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has one of the most critical of missions for Sayyiduna Lut alayhi salam. They're in the area of Sham. This is a little earlier from when we had a discussion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. They're in the area of Sham. And in the area of Sham, there is this one area near uh, the Dead Sea. Some people put it, like Encyclopedia Britannica puts it, that the area of the, uh, underneath the Dead Sea, right in the middle, they said, was the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. The area which Lut alayhi salam was going to be sent to, right? Another place, when they did some archaeological digs, they found that it's close to the Dead Sea, about northeast or so, from the Dead Sea. Basically in that area. And they found some very surprising facts and details. They said roughly around 1900 or so BC, that the whole area was completely demolished, like as, if, as if it was wiped out by an earthquake. Something crazy happened in the area that removed the whole civilization from the ground. Another place when they saw, when they again they did their archaeological digs in the area, in the area of Tallul Hamam, in that area what they found is that they found the area being completely as if it was doused by fire. Everything was as if made into glass. It was like as if it was all completely melted, right? And they found something very interesting. They found the area of the Dead Sea used to have a lot of fresh water. It used to have a lot of fresh water. Right now it's completely dead. Okay, that's what it's called. Dead Sea. Okay, you're not gonna, it's not, it's not able to grow. It, it's not something you can consume. But it had fresh water one time because it's on a lower level. So the water used to flow down, you know, and this is a nice thing. Because when you find that there are lower levels on the ground, water can come in and you have a lot of fresh water easily, mashallah, right? So people can have civilization. This area of Sodom and Gomorrah, this whole area has like roughly, they said about 4,000 or so able-bodied men. And they say that they were, each of the skulls, each of the communities had roughly maybe four to 40,000 people. It's huge, this area that's there. It's an area that they can travel. If they want to go to Sham, they want to go to the area of Quds, right, which is the area of Jerusalem. They have to travel through this area because it has nice fresh water there. There's such fertile land in that area too. It's a beautiful area. It's a remarkable area. Even the Bible indicates the same thing. Lut alayhi salam, the area that he went to was a lush fertile land. Okay, at one time it was a lush fertile land. What's interesting again, the archaeologists archeolog found is that um, every other community in that area of the 1900s or 1500 BC or so, Every other community in that area start to flourish and grow, except for the area that is in the Dead Sea. Something happened to them that wiped them off completely from the ground. Okay, this is all again recorded archaeological facts. This is amazing stuff. But I rec recommend, inshallah, people to search into. Not for the top of our conversation, of course. So then, what happens is Sodom and Gomorrah has a, a you know they're a flourishing community. They have lots of people traveling through them. They have lots of produce, lots of greenery, lots of ground. Everything is there. Okay, and so when you have this type of community that has all of this wealth and all of this health and everything, you're starting to get a glimpse as to why it's so important to our modern society. Because you and I, subhanAllah, living in our time, we find ourselves also in wealth and health. We find ourselves also living in wealth and health.
Automatically, when people have lots of money and lots of wealth and they're doing well in the world, they automatically start to do something which is also very negative, which is commit sins, right? To commit a lot of crimes. So one incident happens, Ibn Abbas narrates that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah have an issue. They're saying that when we invite all these travelers in, when we invite all these travelers in, they're taking away all our produce. They're taking away all our produce. So we have nothing left for ourselves. In other words, we feed everyone who's coming in. We have nothing else for ourselves, right? So they said, you know what? In order to, to stave them off, start to tax them. Anyone who comes into the community, tax them. Marry them off. And if they want to marry on any of our women, if, they want to, if they're attracted to any of our women, and they want to marry in, you're going to give them a heavy tax just to get married to them. Okay? Along with that, they said, we can easily ambush them and take them off by putting some highway robbers on the way. So they put poles and taxes everywhere. You know, subhanAllah, what is the, mashallah, when you drive, right? You're all driving on the highway. What do you guys hit every single time? When well, you're going like over, you know, state by state. Well, you hit tolls, right? MashaAllah, this is the sunnah of the Qom Lut, MashaAllah. <laughs> okay? <laughs> that you have to, it's ajib. You have to understand the concept of a toll is the most absurd thing, SubhanAllah. You're traveling in the same country, you have a passport here. You have citizenship. Why in God's name are you paying to move from state to, you know, like why? Why would that be a thing that you just want to move around in the area? Now you have to pay them to move, SubhanAllah. Ajib. That's why in the Muslim Ummah, I want you to know, it was spanned from like Asia all the way to basically Europe. There was no tolls, no taxes, nothing like that, Masha. You travel completely free. No need of any other passports. Just one, which is what? Your kalima, la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Enough of a passport and enough of a visa, mashallah. So keeping this in mind, don't worry, don't cause an outrage at the next time you go to polls or taxes or whatever, okay? So the thing is that, tolls, I'm sorry. So having said that, they started to create these tolls. Along with that, they created, um, they had a system where they said, we'll keep people on the ambush on the outside. If anyone comes to travel, they will come and attack them, so that way they don't feel inclined to come near our town anymore. Ajib, ajib. And this is all again recorded in the Qur'an. This is all recorded in the Qur'an. Lut Ali will tackle them about these things. So these people, subhanAllah, to make sure people didn't come in, they would do such a thing. Okay? What are they doing inside the town? Inside the town, the, the, the corrosion, the, the filth has reached to such a level. The Qur'an describes them in just one word, which we can get the whole glimpse of Sayyidina Lut Ali's people. Allah Ta'ala says, وَلُوطًا إِذْ نَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْقَرْيَةِ الَّتِي كَانَتْ تَعْمَلُ الْخَبَائِثِ And, the, uh, and Lut Ali salam, when we saved him from a community that was doing khabaith, doing filth, committing filth. The word khabith in Arabic is used for corrosion. It's used for something which has worn out, right? Something that has because, you know, like for example, rust. Right, when rust becomes so severe, the actual metal starts to break, right? It actually starts to you know, bend and actually distort itself, right? For example, if you have any pipes at home, subhanAllah, if, if you get some type of corrosion on there, it could cause major damage to your house, right? A lot of different things can happen. When, when wood corrodes, when rust, cor when uh, iron corrodes, when metal corrodes, these things have a ba bad impact on the entire structure. Right, so I give the example of the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is a good example of corrosion, subhanAllah. This whole thing, although it looks very nice on the outside, you see a nice fully burqa covered woman on the outside, right? She wears a nice hat to keep her hijab on, right? You see this woman that's covered on the outside. Inside is almost completely hollow. 50% of it has been hollowed out because of the rust and the corrosion that's happening. How do you even work on something like that, right? How do you maintain it properly, right? If you don't maintain something, what happens automatically to it? It starts to deteriorate, okay? Now the Qom has become completely, the area of Sodom and Gomorrah has become completely deteriorated. Everything about it has become deteriorated. Allah Ta'ala says, Ta'mal al What is the filth that's going on? If you're looking at the, the financial structures, riba is being committed there, haram is being committed there, briberies, right, fraud, scamming, everything's been committed in there. Economic sector, that's one place. If you're looking at their juristic system, right? Their area of their judges and their juries, etc. You're finding that every single one of the judges is being paid off. There is such khubuth, such filth that's been there that the judge is someone who's working for one side automatically. You just bribe him and you get to pay for whatever you need. You're finding a community where the parents are disobeying the children. I'm sorry, they're not listening to the children and the children are disobeying the parents. The whole family structure has also been corroded. You're finding that if you're looking at anywhere in the society, every place you're looking at is become filthy upon filthy. Intoxication, drinking, haram on haram on haram. This is why subhanAllah, I tell everyone, when you look at the Qom Lut, it's just looking at a sample of what we're looking at today. If you were to look at Qom Lut, you're going to look at modern day Manhattan. It's the same exact type of process, same exact stuff. And the worst thing that the Qom Lut does is that they invent something which no one has done in the entire world. Right? At that time, no one has ever done. Such an affront against humanity is the idea of homosexuality. Why is it such a terrible thing? Because you can imagine what it means to be human. 
being human means at least biologically speaking as a as a as an animal you should be able to pass down your genes to the next generation what can you not what can you do what can you not do automatically once you sign on to this you're not going to be able to have children anymore there's no way. Biologically speaking, this is a failure. That's why when one atheist was brought onto the stage and he was asked about what does evolution say about homosexuality, uh, he had no answer because, again, ho evolutionary-wise, homosexuality is not the right thing to do. You know, animals, if they were to be what it, kind of mixing with the same gender, they're not going to have any children for the next one, right? So the animal is going to what's going to happen to a species. It's going to go towards extinction, okay? And so the, 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 the atheist was really stuck because... You know, what, how, do you, can you, how can you defend this on the evolutionary paradigm? So when he was up there, he was asked, what does, what does evolution say about um, homosexuality? He, he, the only answer he could come up with was, this is nature's way of controlling the population of humanity. It's the only way to control human population. Subhanallah, subhanallah, ajib. So again, number one, it's that, that as a human, this is not the right way to live because it's going to destroy your species. Number one. If you gave Qomalut a couple of generations anyways, they would have killed themselves off anyways. Secondly, the reason why it's so bad because it's an affront against humanity because this has, as, as a human being, what is our goal, what is our purpose in life as a human? To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to worship your pleasures or yourself. If subhanAllah, you get a good life here, alhamdulillah. If, if you didn't have such a swell life, you didn't have like a lot of money or a lot of wealth or anything like that, still if you worship Allah, would you be successful? Alhamdulillah, you still will be successful. As a Muslim, mashallah, you're always successful no matter who you are, where you are. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. That's what it is. A, a person who adopts this lifestyle of Qawm Lut, unfortunately, they've abandoned, number one, their own way of uh, advancing their species. And second, they gave up on what it means to be human completely. Okay? So now you can imagine, they abandoned their own wives, the whole community is like so, men with men, women with women, this whole community is committing this fahisha. Okay? If you want to put it into one phrase, this is a whole community of Fir'auns. This is a whole community of Fir'auns. People who ultimately just follow themselves, they think they themselves to be their own gods, they live themselves their own worship, they worship themselves, they do whatever they want. This is the qawm that Sayyidina Lut is being sent to. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for one Fir'aun, Allah does sends one of the greatest of the Rusul, which is Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. Allah does sends Musa alayhi salam to Fir'aun. One, one Fir'aun, Allah sends Musa alayhi salam to hundreds of thousands of, of Fir'auns in the Qawm of Sadum. Allah sends one Rasul, which is Lut alayhi salam. I need you to understand this caliber of this man alayhi salam. Because why? SubhanAllah, to deal with sinners is a very unique thing. It's something the whole Muslim Ummah has forgotten. To deal with sinners does not require a harsh person. To deal with sinners, people who are committing crimes and haram, requires a gentle person. This is Lut in the very name that he got. In Arabic, when you look up Lata Yalutu, we look up Lut name, right? It comes from, from Lata Yalutu. You look it up, it says, Hada al bi qalbi. This is Al Saku bi qalbi. They said, This connects more to my heart. They said that the word Lut actually refers to attachment and connection. Lut word is about being uh, someone who can connect to the heart. And they mentioned about Lat to be someone who conceals, someone who is able to conceal things around him. So he's someone, subhanAllah, because of his very nature, he's very soft, he's gentle, and he can communicate to people's hearts in a very soft, gentle way. To the point that even the Hebrew, the Arabic is the same as the Hebrew in this. The names are the same in terms of Arabic and Hebrew. Even to the word, the name Malat, in, Arab, in, in Hebrew, we look at Malat. Malat means a person who has been saved from a very difficult position. <laughs> SubhanAllah. A person who has been saved from a very difficult position. His name, mashallah, Allah has put already everything that's in his story. So Lut is sent to the people of Sadum. When he goes there, he sees the filth in the, judge, in the jury system. He sees the filth in the economic system. He sees the filth in the society. He sees the filth in the families. He sees the filth everywhere. So what does he start with? Like, what do you talk about, right? And this is the thing. You and I see the guy, you know, he's running around, you know, what does this guy look like? This guy nowadays is like what? This LGBT gay pride guy, right? He's running around, right? What is he wearing? He's wearing the, the, the rainbow flag as a cape, right? He has nothing else on except his underwear, which is also a rainbow, right? This guy running around the streets saying, gay pride, gay pride, gay pride, right? And you and I looking at him like, oh my God, what the heck is wrong with this guy? How do I help this guy, right? How do I, what? You don't even want to be near him. You feel like there's, a, there's like a certain like aura around him, a homosexual aura that you can't get near around, right? SubhanAllah. You're feeling so weird about him. But I want to tell you, these types of people, SubhanAllah, there's a whole community, a qawm like them called Sadum, okay? And Sayyidina Lut salam, goes right in the midst of them, like every other Nabi does, with full confidence, okay? And he spends a lot of time there. 
By the way, in Arabic, when you say Qawm Lut, right, you, really, you can't say this is his nation, right? You can only, like, you have to be born from those people to be a Qawm. For example, I'm Bangladeshi, so I'm the Qawm of Bangladesh, right? This is my Qawm, you know? That's, I can say it because my father is from there. Lut is not from Sadum. That's not his Qawm. There's only one other way to be from the Qawm. In Arabic, the only other way to be from the Qawm is either you're married into the family of the Qawm somehow. They said maybe Lut Alisam's in-laws were, you know, these kinds of people, maybe, I don't know. But the other way is that you spent so much time there that now people associate you with that place. You know, so for example, I, I'm from New York, but because I spent so much time in Massachusetts now, everyone thinks I'm from Massachusetts. The Muhaddisin said, if you spend four years somewhere, you're automatically attributed to that place. So Lut Alisam spent years upon years while Ibrahim Alisam is doing everything he's doing. The extraordinary stuff he's doing. Lut Alisam spent years upon years in the area of Sodom. You and I would have a heart attack being there to see this guy walking around in his, in his rainbow underpants, underwear, everywhere. But Lut Alisam is engaging with them. And he comes with a very fundamental question. What is the question? He comes and says to them first and foremost, Will you not have taqwa of Allah? This is the question that no one seems to want to ask a person who has LGBTQ tendencies. And I find it so frustrating, may Allah forgive, but I find it very frustrating that we're the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we're the, most, so much, we're the people that are the most against the da'wah to these people. You know, Allah forgive us. These are the people that are in most need of hidayah, but we're the ones who are most hesitant to give them the hidayah. And this is what Lut Aysim came to his people, not to say, why are you gay? Right? He didn't come and say, hey, why are you gay? Why? He didn't go home and say that. He, what did he say? He said, why don't you worship one Allah? Because if you're going to solve the problem, you're not going to solve the problem by fixing this one amal, this one action. You have to fix the iman, the beliefs. So he comes and says, Allah tattaqoon, don't you have any fear of Allah? Inni lakum rasulun ameen. I'm surely a trustworthy messenger from Allah. He goes and says to them, take kalima, la ilaha illallah, lutun rasulullah. He says, take the kalima from me. This is Lut Alayhi amazing da'wah. And it's become so frustrating, may Allah forgive. This is why, subhanAllah, Muslims around the world have done nice things. They keep da'wah tables. And I, may Allah reward them for it. During the time of gay pride, while they're doing all the weird stuff, they have da'wah tables there if anyone's interested to learn about Islam. I tell you, mashallah, this is the only, you're only going to find that in Islam. That Muslims will be so crazy to think that these people who are so off the manhaj, off the right way of Islam, off the way of Allah Ta'ala, they would think they'll set up a da'wah table and give them da'wah to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That's why I tell everyone, Lut some he recognizes and he's telling us through this as direction, that look, no matter how much a person's a sinner, guna God off the right path, they still are entitled to the kalima, la ilaha illallah. No matter who they are, they are deserving of this kalima. Lut Aizam gives them the da'wah, إِنِّي لَكُمْ رَسُولٌ أَمِينٌ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ فِيعَ اللَّهِ وَاطِعُونَ أُبَيْ مِي وَمَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَنِهِ مِنْ أَجْرٍ I don't ask you for any money. I don't look for any status. I'm not looking for any payment for this da'wah. إِنْ أَجْرِيَ إِلَّا عَلَى رَبِّ الْعَنَمِينَ My ajr is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lut Aizam gives them this powerful da'wah to them. Tells them, why don't you worship this one Allah alone? What are you scared of? What are you worried about? What are you frightened of? And I tell you, subhanAllah, we have these conversations. And subhanAllah, it's a deep thing when you make a person realize, what are you doing this for? Lut Aizam, number one, he tackles it like this. He goes in first and foremost, gives them the kalima. And so I strongly advise for anyone, when you have this conversation, be like, brother, brother, that's great, you're doing all this stuff, but where do you think we're going to go after we die? Right? Where do you think we came from? Where do you think everything came from? Where did the whole universe come from? Don't you agree that you know, this universe came from somewhere? Where did that something come from? Where did that something come from? Where did that thing come from? Don't you agree that something without a beginning should have made everything, you know? Shouldn't, if you see dominoes fall, automatically your mind starts to see, if you start to think, if you see dominoes fall, you tell yourself that someone must have hit the first domino. And he himself is not a domino, right? SubhanAllah, you can easily explain it to them that this whole world universe that you see that is here, clearly someone without a beginning must have began everything. I think that's our creator, that's our maker. And you start to explain it very nicely to them. Have a conversation, don't be shy. You never know what a person will get click, clicked on, connected to Hidayah because of this, inshallah. May Allah make us the hadith, the guides to this, to this inshallah ta'ala. Lut he gives us this first. And then he goes and says, Innakum latatun al fahisha. You have come with such a fahisha. He says, you have come with such an indecency, such an evil, such an atrocity. مَا سَبَقَكُمْ بِهَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ He says in a, such a profound way. He says that you have, you've come with such an indecency that no one in the entire world has ever done something even close to this. 
right? Ahadim min al alamin. No one has done anything like this. He appeals in a very ajib way. Lut Aizm speaks to them in a very unique way. He says that you are the first human beings in all of ex existence to come up with this type of filth. Okay? To give you an analogy, so that way it's kind of clear for you all, to understand like what Lut Aizm is trying to say here. Um, everyone know what gender reveal parties are? Right? Gender reveal parties, right? So what is it? Originally, it's supposed to be some type of wackadoo bid'ah. Right? What is this bid'ah? supposed to be that, oh, we want to kind of surprise everyone about our gender because it's so important, right? Wah, wow, wah. Wow. To know if it's a boy or a girl has become such a wondrous thing, subhanAllah. Ajabul ujab, right? SubhanAllah. It's such a wondrous thing that everyone needs to know. So what do we do? We make a party out of it. And what do we do? We put both pink and, and blue balloons there. And then what do we do? We, we have this little guessing game or like this type of thing. Maybe we'll play like tic-tac-toe and then we'll have like red and uh, blue and yellow, pink up there. And then, you know, it, we'll just keep playing the game until finally, oh, what an amazing thing. Wow, it's a boy or a girl. That's amazing, right? So then what happens is but now one guy does this bid'ah, right? And then people automatically start to say, you know, that's kind of boring. The tic-tac-toe, that's a really boring way to show what the gender is. So what does the next person do? Does he do the same tic-tac-toe? What does he do? He says, no, I'll do something even beyond tic-tac-toe, right? So then they'll play like this balloon game. So they have all these balloons filled up with water, right? And they'll just keep popping each one with like darts and stuff, right? Getting a little dangerous, but no problem. So they start hitting darts. So they'll hit like hundreds of balloons. And finally, the one dart that has the, the card in it that says, it's a boy or it's a girl. Wow, oh, wow, really nice. So the next guy is like, nah, that's kind of boring too. I think I can up the game, right? So then what does the guy do? Now nah, they're shooting rockets, right? What do they do? They're shooting rockets, right? So now they're shooting rockets up in the air. So now it's going to shoot fireworks. SubhanAllah, getting a little bit more lethal now, right? SubhanAllah. So then what happens is they shoot the fireworks up and the firework that comes up and says, it's a boy or it's a girl. Wow, wow, amazing, right? Next guy's like, no, that's boring. Let's use guns. Let's use guns, right? Let's use, let's, let's, sh let's shoot it up, right? Let's just, let's just shoot it and then we'll see, right? And now, now we're getting to places where people can actually get hurt because this is what happens with gender reveal parties. It's so absurd in the beginning. This is a pagal thing to do. And you, you're like, oh, Molana, we, we're Muslim. We'll never do a gender reveal party. La ilaha illallah. You guys do this with your weddings. Allah forgive you. Don't even play with me. Okay? The weddings are the same. Because why? One guy did one thing in the wedding. No one's happy with that one thing. Right? We have to up the ball. So if he didn't have horses, I'm going to have horses. If he, didn't have, if he had a horse, I'm going to have a chariot. If he, had a ch if he has a chariot, I'll have a chariot pulling a limo. You know, like we'll do crazy things upon crazy things. Because we always have to up the ball. So Lut Aleyhisselam goes and says to them, and this is what I want you to understand. He goes and says, no human has come up with this before. You are the first people to come up with this crazy thing. What is going on in your brain? Why would you do a thing that no human has ever thought to do? Okay? Now mind you, human beings subhanAllah, have been living there for thousands of years by now. It's been such a long time. They've come with wondrous, amazing things. Right? But no one has found that this is the right way to do any of this stuff. Lut Aleyhisselam goes and says, he appeals to them, thinking about, first and foremost, that this fahisha, this khabis thing, he doesn't need to say it out loud because they already know what is it. It's khabis, it's fahisha. You ask any of these people outside LGBTQ, ask any of them. They already know it's a bad thing to do. They know it's a bad thing to do. They have no shame about it. That's the problem. Right? So you, he goes and appeals to them and says, you're doing a fahisha. And no one has done this fahisha before. Number one is that he tells them that this is a bid'ah innovation that no one has ever done. Think about it. Is this the right thing to do? Secondly, he tries to tell them as a warning that if you commit a haram, if you commit a haram that no one has ever done, now people start to copy you on it. You will get the sin of everyone who does it after you. Lut Aleyhisselam goes and says to them in a very profound way, you committed such an act, now anyone who does this homosexuality haram act, is the sin will come on the people of Qomilut. So for example, people who commit a new way of committing haram, that person will, because he made their way to do it, he'll get the sin. So for example, Qabil, in the beginning of time, Habil and Qabil, right? When Qabil, he killed his brother Habil, the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said that anyone who kills afterwards, Qabil gets a share of that sin. Qabil gets a share of that sin. Lut Aizam says, do you all want to gamble everything? That you committed such a haram that now anyone who does it afterwards is going to come to you. And I mention all these things because I want to make it very clear to everyone. In America, we live in a very ajib, ajib place. This America and Islam is the most ajib thing ever. Such things were not done in the entire dunya, are done in America. With no shame, no sharam, nothing. They don't care, they've never seen it. They never seen the the separation, the partition between men and women that the speaker will speak on the right side and left side. This has never been seen, right? Would you agree with me that you never seen it in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan? You never seen it in any Arab countries. None of these things. You never seen it. But in America, oh, we come to a new deen. So then what do we do? We invent a new way. 
right? مَا سَبَقَكُمْ بِهَا مِنْ أَحَدِ مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ There none of the ulama of the past have ever done this. No one has ever done this. Who's doing it first time? Right? In America, you get such ajeeb things. The whole Muslim ummah for 1400 years has been following moon sighting. Right? Subhanallah. But now, subhanallah, we've become so advanced. We've understood something no one else has understood. So what do we do? We follow calculations. You find the entire ummah has been doing hand slaughter, hand slaughter, hand slaughter. Has there been machine slaughter in the past? No. That's what I'm trying to tell you. In America, you get such profound things, ajeeb things, extraordinary things. People in this country are inventing things, new things. مَا سَبَقَهُمْ بِهَا مِنَ حَدِ مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ Same exact thing. Now you need to ask yourself, if I don't have an example, maybe it's a good thing or bad thing, right? Maybe I should think about it if it's good or bad for the ummah. Does that make sense? That's all I'm asking for. People to think about it just one step further. Just to see that, you know, if we're just putting, putting people in the masjid and they were putting a tape between them or some chairs between them, that maybe the guy here, the young boy here that has not been married, he's asking his mom to get married for so long. He has a full access to look at all the women, right? If it was your... And some brother asked me, he said that, Brother, how is Islam going to survive in America if we don't have, like, you know, this type of partition stuff? I said, Brother, I said, don't talk about Islam. He said, uh, he said well, how could Islam survive? I said, brother, don't talk about Islam. Islam, Allah will protect, okay? That's not your job or my job, okay? Allah will defend his deen. I said, just think about your own wife and daughter. Don't ask me about Islam. Ask me about your wife and daughter. Would you be comfortable that Shaykh Mawlana Shakil Rahman will be looking at the woman's side and looking your wife eye to eye from here? Would you be okay with that? Your wife, married woman. Mashallah, probably beautiful too, mashallah. Allah bless you, mashallah, right? You, would you be okay with the sheikh looking at her eye to eye? If it was your daughter, 16 years old, 17 years old, the sheikh is making eye to eye contact, would you be okay with it? Is the sheikh not a man? Could any thought come to You know men, better, you all know men better than I do, Mo, right? We're all men, we know what type of wolf he is on the inside, sheep on the outside, right? I know what he's thinking of. SubhanAllah, I said, brother, and then I told the brother that, he said, yeah, you're right, sheikh, I, don't, I would never be comfortable. I said, then that's what we should understand. I don't care what people say. You have to understand. مَا سَبَقَكُمْ بِهَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ Lut says it very clearly, beautifully, mashallah, he explains this. Beautiful principle for us in the modern world. إِنَّكُمْ لَتَأْتُونَ rijal. You surely approach men. شَهْوَةً Out of desire, مِنْ دُونِ nisa, Other than women. Okay? There's always the absurd person who says that they're raping men and stuff like that. This is an absurd thing, okay? They said that Lut says people were raping men instead of women. It's a weird thing. I have no idea what the heck they're trying to say. But let me look at the ayah. I want you to understand something here. Very deep. إِنَّكُمْ لَتَأْتُونَ الرِّجَالِ Surely you, you go towards men, you advance towards men. شَهْوَةً He says, purely out of desire. مِن دُونِ nisa, Other than women. He makes two beautiful points here. Number one, and I want you to note, when he comes to them and talks to them, does he say that biologically speaking, brother or sister, you as a human being, biologically speaking, you're not supposed to go towards uh, men because why? Because nature.com said that they study so many DNA genes and all these things. Did Luther Aysom talk about DNA here? Did he talk about genes here? No. Did he talk about nature versus nurture here? No. He doesn't talk about these because I want to tell you as Muslims, subhanAllah, you need to understand something. I don't care. This is the thing. As Muslims, we really don't care if it comes from nature or nurture. Okay? If it comes from nature or nurture, in the Quran, it's actually deeper than that. What does the Quran say? وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمْرِ ذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ ذَا جَلَّاهَا وَاللَّيْلِ ذَا يَغْشَاهَا وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَنَاهَا وَالْأَرْضِ مَا تُحَاهَا Allah Ta'ala takes a lot of oaths here. He says, I swear by the sun, I swear by the moon, I swear by the earth, I swear by the sky, I swear by uh, night, I swear by day. Allah swearing by a lot of stuff, right? He takes oaths, a lot of stuff. And Allah swears by the soul. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَاهَا فَالْحَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Allah says, I swear by the soul. Allah says, I swear by the fact that He put in the soul good and evil. Allah Ta'ala says it's much deeper than DNA. People getting stuck on DNA. In reality, your, your feeling towards good comes from your soul. And your feeling towards evil comes from your soul. This is the thing. Lut Aysam doesn't care where it comes from. He says, this is your problem. You're going straight because you desire it. Because you want it. That's all it is. If, it, if, you, if you have a feeling, like, you know, these young kids would be like, Mulan, this bayan's going crazy. I have no idea where this bayan's going. I really want to kill you right now. In his heart, this is the feeling. The intention in his heart. His, the feeling comes. Okay? Whether the feeling comes from nature or nurture, should he kill Mullah Shakil? <laughs> you know, like, no, no, like, you, yeah, maybe, you know, the thing is that like, you tell yourself that no matter what thought comes in your mind, whatever thought comes in your mind, you still have to choose to do it or not. You still have to choose to do it or not. This is the thing Luta Aysam is saying. You're, not, you're choosing to do this and not because there's some benefit in it in terms of like biologically speaking or the fact that the species will advance and stuff. You're clearly doing this, purely doing this because you want it, you have a passion towards it. And just because you want it, should you do it? This is the thing. 
People today, they go and say, love is love, brother. Love is love. I said, are you, are you, are you sure you want to go down this path? Are you sure you want to go down this path? He said, yeah, yeah, love is love, brother. I said, okay. What happens if I, um, let's see, well, which, which example do you want from me, right? SubhanAllah, about what loves could not be correct, right? What happens if I love my own biological brother? What would you say now? You know, SubhanAllah, if a person was in, in, interested in incest, right? Or a person was interested in necrophilia, they fell in love with the dead body, right? Now you're going to say love is love? Right? You're going to go even, that's what I'm saying. The absurdity of the statement of love is love really breaks down on so many different levels, right? A person who falls in love with his car, he wants to marry his car. He names his car Betsy and he marries the car Betsy, right? And then they have this amazing wedding, right? Or he marries his cat or marries his dog. You think this stuff is crazy? I'm giving you actual real data here. I'm giving you real facts that has happened in humanity because this is how absurd love is love has become, okay? No one agrees with love is love. At certain points, certain times, you'll say love is love completely breaks down. This is not an argument. Lut goes and says to them, you're clearly desiring this. Mean dunin nisa, you're desiring this. Why can't you just change what you desire? That's all it is. Why can't you stop yourself from your desires? Because as Muslims, what are we supposed to do? If you have something haram, you and I, subhanAllah, we have a halal wife, mashallah. You and I are obligated in Islam to only go towards a halal wife, only look at our halal wife. That's all it is. You cannot go towards anything else. That's absolutely haram for you. Now, if you have a feeling in your heart for other women, what, what must you do? You must stop yourself from going towards these things. A person might have love for alcohol, love for gambling, love for haram, love for drugs, all these loves. Love is love, right? If they have love for these things, should they pursue gambling? You tell yourself, no, a man's going to destroy his life if he were to gamble like so. A person needs to recognize in Islam, when you have desires, the rule in Islam is you fight your desires. And inshallah, you get rewarded for this. Lut said, you have the shahwa. Now control your shahwa. If you control your shahwa, you get rewarded by Allah Ta'ala. This is an amazing thing. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I tell these kids, you become wali, mashallah. You go on YouTube, you go on Facebook, you go on Twitter, and then what happens is a, a haram image comes up. Okay? Now generally, our, our people will be like, ooh la la, oh wow, okay, this is very nice. Right? Ooh la la, wow, it's amazing. Wow, this girl looks really nice. Ooh la la, no one's looking, right? No one's right here, right? So like, ooh la la, right? This is how we are. But if I tell you, subhanAllah, you saw this, and then you said, astaghfirullah, and you closed your eyes, and you swiped up, and you kept going, right? You get an ajr, you get a reward by that, mashallah. The Prophet Wasallam, he narrates a hadith, and there are many hadiths on this topic about controlling the gaze. I can mention so many of them. But Rasulullah said that the nazar is one of the, the poisonous arrows of shaitan. The looking is one of the poison arrows of shaitan. Whoever, Allah Ta'ala says, whoever controls it, Allah will make him taste the sweetness of iman. You will taste iman when people say, I don't enjoy Islam. Allah Ta'ala, if you control your gaze, Allah will make sure you start enjoying the prayer. That sweetness you will get, you'll never find anywhere else. Another hadith of the Prophet says, hadith of Tirmidhi, good hadith. The Prophet says, whoever controls their gaze, Allah Ta'ala will give them one ajr, one hasana. Now I tell people, mashallah, during summertime, you walk in through the mall, you lower your gaze, you stop looking, mashallah, you probably become a wali of Allah Ta'ala by the time you leave the mall, mashallah. You really will, inshallah Ta'ala. You get a lot of reward, mashallah. Control yourself. Control yourself. You're not an animal. Shahwa is for animals. We are not animals. We're insan. Ilutaizam says, stop acting like an animal. Be a human being. Minduni nisa. He says, you approach men out of shahwa, but not women. Like, you don't want women instead? Now, this is a, a beautiful argument. I, I tell you, it's a beautiful argument if you thought about it. Ilutaizam says, you're really going towards men and not women? You know, subhanAllah, that hairy man, <laughs> that, that hairy man, it was one that grows hair in the wrong places. The smelly guy, you know, subhanAllah, you know, you and I looking at a man would be like, why? The man is a, just, just, just why? Like, why would they choose this guy? Like, this guy really, the man who's all hairy and ugly and smells like whatever and everything like that. You, you wonder why women even like us, subhanAllah. Really, you wonder, right, subhanAllah. You know, I had to actually preparing this bayan. I actually asked my wife, I said, why are you even like, uh, you, you even like me? You know, subhanAllah. Because I don't get it. You know, like, subhanAllah. I can see a woman and I totally understand, right? MashaAllah, nice smell, nice scent. Beautiful lady, MashaAllah, right? We understand why men like women. But Luta Aizam says, Min dunin nisa. Really? Really? You're not going to choose a woman over a man? Right? SubhanAllah, right? Even the fact that if I were to break this down even deeper, you guys like, Mawlana knows too much about homosexuals. Don't, don't you know, mashallah. The thing is that, SubhanAllah, the idea that a, a man would choose a man. Right? That's what Luta Aizam says, very beautiful in another place. Atatuna Zukran. Luta Aizam says, Are you really approaching males? Min al alamin out of the whole universe? Out of the whole universe, you only can choose men? Really? What does Arun and he actually gives them a beautiful job? Beautiful job. Only comes from the word, the tongue of a Nabi. What does Arun and you leave? Ma khalaqa lakum rabbukum 
min azwajikum, you leave that which Allah has created for you. Your Rabb has created for you from your spouses, from your pairs, he says. It's a beautiful thing. He says that you, Allah has created for you pairs, that you have, mashallah, a, a pair from the females. Why? What is a zoj? In Arabic, zoj means something that completes you. You know, like when you have like a puzzle set, right? There's that one piece that's missing. No matter how much you try to squeeze in one piece, if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. Right? The zoj is someone that fits perfectly. And this is the amazing thing about marriages. Every time I look at marriages, I'm absolutely astounded. None of it makes any sense to me. Because why? Because like the, the, the really soft, gentle, nice lady, she's very much attracted to the strong, powerful man. And there's a, you find, mashallah, like there's always one angry guy in the couple, right? One angry person in the couple. Either the husband is angry or the wife is angry. One or the other, right? If they're both angry, that's like, that's like total carnage, right? Someone needs to chill out, right? So then what do you find? Either the, the wife is a very angry person or the husband is a very angry person. And what do you find the other one to be? Cool, nice, soft, relaxed. Who, who, who managed to put these personalities together so they fit so well? Right? Only, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Luta Aysam says, Your Rabb, the one who created you, from the, he is your Rabb. He did everything for you. Tarbiya, everything about you is from Allah Ta'ala. This Allah has had a spouse, a zoj for you, ready for you from the females. Why would you leave that for some smelly, ugly, dirty guy? Right? Why would you do that? Lut Aysam gives him such a beautiful eye. He says that, don't you trust, he goes and says, don't you trust Allah that if Allah wrote you someone that he'll choose the best one for you, why wouldn't you choose them? SubhanAllah, he gives him such a smart, and I couldn't, I would never even think to say this to them. Because I would think like, why would you even discuss with these people? But Lut Aysam gives us such a profound response, mashallah. But antum qawmu musrifun. Rather, you are transgressing. You are excessive people. Everything about you is israf. You just want to do more and more and more and more. But antum qawmun adun. You seem like a transgressing and people that go overbound. But antum qawmun tajhalun. You seem like a very ignorant people. You know, but antum tubusirun. You're doing this fahisha while you see it happening. Why would you do it? You know, they themselves can realize it's wrong. So Lut Aysam gives him these small little answers, small responses, mashallah. And he goes and says, you know, about desires and everything. Now the people of Lut Aysam are hearing this from him. Lut Aysam goes there, goes here, goes there. One time he comes up to their gatherings in their, in their, in their markets. He says, إِنَّكُمْ لَتَأْتُونَ رِجَالُ وَتَقْتَعُونَ السَّبِيلُ Why are you killing? Why are you fighting? Why are you attacking the, the travelers that are coming into the path? Why are you uh, into, the, into the city? Why are you attacking them? Why are you doing that? وَتَأْتُونَ فِي نَادِيكُمْ مُنْكَرْ Why are you speaking about such khabis things in your gatherings? Why are you mentioning all these things? He goes everywhere and anywhere that there is something haram being committed. And Lut Aysam is giving some active, proper da'wah. And each one of them, he goes and appeals to them and says, have some haya, have some shame. This is the thing, right? When a person has some problem, when it comes to looking at haram images, may Allah to protect us from this. But a kid, subhanAllah, you know, he, he has a laptop, he has a phone, and he starts to look at all these haram things, right? And the thing is that, that's why I tell parents, be very careful what ammunition you put in the hands of your kid, what weapon you put in his hand, because he can destroy his whole life because of this phone. Wallahi, they can destroy their whole lives because of this phone. Any kid that had any problems in any of their issues is because of the fact that they had social media and that social media has corrupted them, made them into atheists, made them into agnostic, made them into LGBT, everything because of the social media. You have to remove this from these kids, subhanAllah. But having said that, the kid should have some shame, right? So you tell the kid that would you be comfortable, would you be okay to do this haram in, in front of your parents? Would you be okay that you put the laptop in front of your parents and you were to do such a thing? Right? So then you start to appeal to his haya. Lut alayhi the whole time he's just appealing to their shame. He says, don't you have any shame? Don't you have any shame? Don't you have any shame? So now he goes and says that, aren't you feeling embarrassed about what you do? Lut alayhi people have zero shame. This is a community that you're talking about them. The Quran in, 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 has, and this is something very interesting. Every community has a name. Ad, Samud. Right, uh, the the Allah Muslim Muhammad. You know, you get the Ashabu Madian, right? You get all these different names. Qawm al Lut doesn't have a name like in the Quran. You have Qawm al Nuh, for example. Nuh, Nuh alayhi's people were very early, so they don't have a name anyways. You get Qawm Ibrahim. Ibrahim alayhi's name is not mentioned. His Qawm is not mentioned because the Arabs know Qawm Ibrahim. They are Qawm Ibrahim, right? And but Qawm al Lut doesn't have a name. Allah never takes the name of Sadum, the whole Quran, right? Why did Allah not take their name? The only is because the ulama write. That the, the, even to mention their name, they're such ra'in khabis people. Allah said He didn't want to stain His Qur'an with the mention of such, a, such inhuman beings. Could you imagine that? And they mentioned the only name that comes for the Qawm al-Sadum in the Qur'an is Mu'tafikat. Mu'tafik in Arabic means when something is turned away from what it is. The reality of it. Mu'tafikat, the areas that were completely turned. Number one is because they have completely turned what humanity is. 
they no longer have any reason. This is the thing. If you were to go and talk to a person today about just appealing to their shame, they have no shame. You can't talk to people that have no haya anymore. What are you supposed to tell them about? To feel embarrassed? They have no embarrassment. They'll do even worse things now. You tell them to feel some shame, what do they do? They go even worse into it. This is the tragedy of our time. They're exactly like the Qawm Lut. They have no haya and everything they understand is completely inverted. So when Lut comes and gives them this da'wah to them, and he goes and explains this to them, Lut people do not give a response. There's no ju'ab in the Qur'an. I looked through it multiple times. I spent so much time doing this. I look at every single community in the Qur'an, whether it's a Qawm Ibrahim, Qawm Salih, Qawm Hud all the Anbiya have a back and forth, a dialogue with their people. But Lut people have no dialogue. They don't talk. There's no conversation. What do Lut say? They say, وَمَا كَانَ جُوَابَ قَوْمِهِ إِلَّا أَنْ قَالُوا أَخْرِجُوا عَلَى لُوتٍ مِنْ قَرْيَتِكُمْ The Qawm Lut only say, take them out, expel them from your community. إِنَّمْ أُنَاسُوا يَتَطَهَّرُونَ This is literally the playbook of the LGBT community of today. You're looking at this community, the exact playbook that they have. I'll tell you word by word. They say, they don't want to talk to you about this. There's no conversation. They call you a bigot. They call you whatever. They'll say that you're homophobic, whatever. And they just say that if you don't want to live here, then get out. Right? If you don't believe me, look at the, LG, the Lexington High School. Right? This is absurd, right? Just get out. If you don't want to be here, just get out. Akhriju, take out Lut, his family from your community. Innahum unasun yatatahharun. Ajeeb, ajeeb. They say that they are a people yatatahharun. Arabic, this word is deep. It says that they are a people that are pretending to be pious. They are people that are pretending to have uh, tahara. They're not really tahar. They're not really tahir. In other words, they're accusing Sayyiduna Rasul of Allah Ta'ala, Lut alayhi salam. They're accusing him of saying that he's just pretending to be pious. He really wants to do the same haram we're doing too. This is the level of these people. Such khabis people they were. They said, Ya Lutu illam tantahi. If you don't stop Lut, latakunanna minal mukhrajin. You'll be expelled, you'll be exiled, you'll be banished from our community. Get out of here. They said, forget it. There's no conversation. We're going to continue to do a haram. Either you do it with us or you get out of our community. Now this is the push and the force that people feel. And this is what we feel too. Grow, being in America, being where we are, we feel the same exact compulsion sometimes. That why don't we just side with them? Why don't we let them do? And I heard one person, may Allah forgive, that he said it like, you know, people need to learn what Islam says. This is our problem. The brother said that while I was there talking with him. He said that I don't care what they do. They can do whatever they want. You know, live, live, live and let live. Right, if they want to live and let live, you know, let, let them do. I'll, he said, I'll come to their rallies, I'll support them too. I said, Lai, Lai, Allah, man. Whoa, 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 whoa. And I, you know, how can I explain this to you, brother? You cannot support such people, right? You think they want live and let live? Oh, bichara, you, you in the wrong place, man. There's no live and let live here. It's either you, you follow us or you get out of here. That's all the t there's, only, there's only two options here. Either you accept it or you get out. They don't even want you to say that we're okay with you doing what you are doing. They want you to say that you should fully support what we're doing. Endorse it. Sign this for us. Or else what? You're homophobic, you're a bigot. I tell you how many times I got into arguments with these people. It's unbelievable. Every single time it's the same exact thing. There's no discussion. There's no conversation. Either you accept or get out of here. The exact playbook of Qomulut. The exact playbook of Sadum. What is Luta Aysan's response? He goes and says to them when they say, either you do this or get out. Qala, inni li amalikum min al He says, oh my beloved people, he goes and says to them, surely I am whatever you're doing, everything that you're doing here. He says, surely I hate what you're doing. He goes and says, when they tell him you're going to get out, you have to leave, expelled, whatever. He goes and says, people, I want you to know that I really hate what you guys are doing. SubhanAllah, he comes and claps them again. He slaps them again. He says, Min al in Arabic means, I'm from those that hate. Meaning that there are many more people that hate your action too. Although they're not here, they also hate what you're doing. Lut comes and hits them. And he goes and says, you know, you and I, SubhanAllah, we'd be scared. Oh man, what will they do to us? What will they do? Will they take away my passport, my blue passport that I have, my, my bird that I have, my passport? Will I be kicked out of America? All these different things. People say these things till nowadays. Muslims are scared to speak their beliefs. I said, why are you scared? I thought you had hidayah and haq. Why are you terrified? Sayyidina Umar then comes to the Prophet and says, Oh Master of Allah, if, you know, early on in Islam, before they can pray in like anywhere they wanted in front of the Kaaba, before that time, Umar then says, Oh Master of Allah, are we are not the truth. Prophet says, yes, of course we are. Then Prophet says, Umar Adin asks him a very good question. He goes and says, then why are we hiding? What are we scared of? I thought you had the truth. Lut says, I hate what you guys are doing. I don't care if you don't like it. What am I supposed to do? It's still wrong. 
Subhanallah, he comes very strong against them. Lut says this, and he goes in many other places, continues to hit them and hit them and hit them. Now you're wondering, Subhanallah, Lut is there for years. Years have gone. And the people, mashallah, they must have been convinced. Some, some, some impact must have happened in this area. Uh, there must be like at least a hundred families that accepted Islam. Maybe, mashallah, even a thousand families that accepted Islam. Lut when he gives da'wah like this, how many people have accepted Islam? Not hundred, not ten, not five, not three, not even one family accepted Islam in the whole area of Sadum. Lut has been giving da'wah for years. A Nabi's da'wah, gentle, soft da'wah, good da'wah, strong da'wah. But no one has accepted Islam from his community. The only ones that have Islam is the family of Lut himself. Not even the whole family of his, uh, that of Lut accepted Islam, only him and his daughters. Who, the wife of his, uh, Lut is a disbeliever, she's a kafira. Could you imagine this? His wife has such hatred for Lut and what he does, she actually goes out and informs the people whenever Lut goes and invites guests over. Right? Because the people were so upset, they can't kick out Lut This is the thing I want you to know. They can't kick him out. They can't force him out of the community. Because immediately if they were to force out a man from the community because he doesn't accept what they're doing, it make it shows that they lost. They lost intellectually. Right? Because why? You know, subhanAllah, you got two guys coming up to the octagon, two MMA guys, right? So you got like one Habib and the other one's like some Conor McGregor type guy, right? And so they're coming up, right? And then, you know, Conor McGregor's peeing his pants. There's no way he can beat Habib. Absolutely not. No way, right? Impossible. Right? So then what does he have to do? Man, I don't want to get into the octagon with this guy. It's absolutely dangerous for me to get violent here. Right? So what does he do? He says, maybe I can make him miss weight. Or maybe I can talk to him very bad beforehand so he just punches me in the face. So then he's disqualified automatically, right? So Lut Sam, they kept challenging him. They kept challenging him, get out, get out, get out. Lut is not buying the challenge. And so now they're, they're either put in one, two positions. Either they force him out, right? Or they have to live with him there, right? So now they, they can't force him out because it'll show that they were cowards. They have no intellectual argument anymore. They can have no way to fight him, no way to argue against him, nothing. So what do the people do? They say, Lut, you have a full ban on you. You have a full ban on you. A complete ban. You cannot go out to give da'wah anymore. You cannot invite anyone to your house anymore. You cannot speak about the stuff anymore. You're officially completely cancelled. You cannot do anything anywhere anymore. If we find out, they said, we will commit the haram act right before your eyes with that person. So they said that in order to stop you from doing what you're doing, we will, we will prohibit you from everywhere. And if you were to speak to anyone about the da'wah, what you're giving now, we'll commit that haram right before your very eyes. This is the type of level that they went to Lut Islam. Severe. So Lut is in a very difficult position. He's very hard. He can't, what can he do now? This is the most difficult place that he's in. So then what do we find? He starts to make dua. Because now even, at, could you imagine this person, Nabi of Allah Ta'ala, he can't give da'wah outside, he can't give da'wah inside. If he were to give da'wah in his home, his wife will snitch on him and talk to him. He has no comfort from his wife at home. And he has no comfort outside. There's no sahaba for him. There's no companions, nothing. He has absolutely nothing. This man is in the, the, the place of the, the smallest of, of areas right now. There's no one he can go to. But he has one person he can go to, one being he can go to. He raises his hands and makes dua. Rabbi najini wa ahli mimma ya'malun. Rabbi najini, Allah save me wa ahli, save my family mimma ya'malun from what they're doing. Lut starts making dua, fervent, strong dua. Every night, every day making dua. Ya Allah save me and my family. What else can I do now? I'm stuck. I'm completely stuck. And he knows Allah is in his corner. So what do you find? In a town way off in Sham, these three guests come down. And when they come to that area, they come to meet Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's an amazing host. So what does he do? He sees these three guests before even asking about anything. He goes and gets an, a, a, a calf that he has, a small little baby, uh, uh, Muhammad, he has a baby uh, uh, cow that he has, and then he, he slaughters it immediately, right? And he brings the he prepares it beautifully, he, he roasts it, it becomes amazing, extra extraordinary. He brings it before the people, he gets some bread, he brings it over, he tells his wife Sara, we have some guests, you know, mashallah, let, uh, come, let them come inside, let them eat, and we'll all eat together. Such a happy experience he's having. In the other land, this is happening. Lut when Lut is having this issue here, Ibrahim Aysam has these amazing guests over. When the guests are over there, the guests are brought with the food before them. Ibrahim Aysam starts to eat, and like a good, da a good host, he goes and says, Ala Are you not eating? Right? The people though, they look at the food, they're not eating at all. Ibrahim Aysam starts to worry and tells himself, maybe these guests are actually robbers, right? Maybe I invited robbers to my house. So he gets a little worried now. So then finally they say, They say, don't be afraid, right? 
We were only sent ila qomilut. We're sent to the qomilut, right? They were sent to Ibrahim Aysam first, because I mentioned before, Ibrahim Aysam did not have a, had food for such a long time. So Allah gave him guests so that he can eat something, because he only eats with guests, right? So now when Ibrahim Aysam sees these guests over, they, uh, he becomes very surprised, right? At the beginning, he becomes surprised. They tell the good news to Sarah, alayhi salam, that you're going to have Ishaq as a son after Ishaq sumi Yaqub. Ibrahim Aysam thinks about it for a little bit though. He sits there and finally, when he recovers and he realizes that these are angels from Allah Ta'ala, he goes and speaks to them and says, that where, where you're going to Lut's family, you're going to Lut's community, right? He says, that why are you going to Lut's community? Give them time, maybe they'll accept Islam. Give them a little bit more time. Because you know the angels are coming to destroy it. Allah, Ibrahim is told by Allah, Oh Ibrahim, don't ask this question. The command of Allah has come. So now you go to Lut Aysam's area, these angels immediately transport to his area. Lut Aysam sees them. And he has the same experience of Ibrahim Aysam, just slightly different. He sees these guests come into the community, and Lut Aysam very much wants to host them. Because his whole life he's seen as a companion of Ibrahim Aysam, that you host guests that come. So he feels this in his heart. That I see these young, attractive men coming into the community and I really want to invite them to my house. And so now he has this feeling in his heart to do Mehman Nawazi, to be a good host, to be hospitable. But he knows what's going to happen. But subhanAllah, the feeling is so dominant in his heart. He says, people come. Come, come. See Abi Mudaqa min Zara'a. He goes and has a difficult scenario in the Quran. He says, come, come to my house. Come, right? And he tries to protect them because he knows if there's this attractive, maybe the, the people will come and attack them and things like that. So he brings them to his house, Sayyidina Luta alayhi salam. And now they're inside the home, and Lut Aysam tries to explain it to him and says, Guys, you guys are here, but I want you to know you came into the wrong town. This town is completely wild. You're not going to have a good time here. You need to get out of here as soon as possible. As soon as he brings the nice men in the house though, the wife of Lut Aysam immediately leaves. And when she leaves, she goes and informs the town, Lut has brought in very handsome guests into his house. You all need to go and get in there and stop him from what he's doing. So while this whole thing, the scenario is happening, Lut Aysam is trying to speak to them very nicely. Whatever food he has, he tries to bring it. They're not eating again. Lut Aysam is still a little surprised. But before he can express his surprise, he's hearing slams and bangs at the door. And people are slamming the door. And they're hitting the door so much, it sounds like they're about to break the door. So Lut Aysam is holding it from the other side. And trying to tell them, people, what are you doing? What is this? Are you, are you really just going to barge into my house like that? He's having such a difficult experience right now. They're saying from outside the door, أَوَلَمْ نَنْهَكَ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ Didn't we stop you from going giving da'wah like this? What are you doing, Lut? And Lut Aizam says, people, please, فَلَا تَفْدَحُونَ Don't disgrace me in front of my guests. The books of Tafsir, right? They actually break down the door. And so they come into the house of Lut Aizam. Now this is the thing. When you do such a terrible act like this, you barge into the house, you storm in like so. Lut Aizam's not home alone, right? He has his daughters at home. So Lut Aizam goes and says, in front of my daughters, you're going to do such a thing? Right? How could you control your anger at this moment? How could you control yourself from becoming violent? Right? You as a man, if a someone came into you, you're going to go Bismillah Allahu Akbar on this boy. This boy is going to be finished. It's not even going to be a moment you're going to kill this man. How dare you barge into my house when my wife and my daughters are at home? SubhanAllah. Lut alayhi SubhanAllah at this moment, could you imagine what type of stress he's going through? The type of tension he's going through? And he goes and says such an ajeeb thing that can only be said by a Nabi alayhi salam. To show the heights of compassion in the hearts of Lut alayhi salam. What does he say at this moment? He says, Ya qawm, my beloved people. He says, Ha'ulai banati hunna atharu lakum. He said, these are my daughters here. If you want, O oh people, were you to become pious and salih and neck and good and become a righteous people, Ha'ulai banati, these are my daughters, hunna atharu lakum. They're pure for you. I will marry you off to them. He goes and says in a beautiful, one of the most critical moments, he makes such an amazing appeal to these people. He goes and says that if you become righteous and pious and good, I will marry you off to my daughters. Now I ask anyone here to meet any sinful person in this world, would you ever offer your daughter to such an individual? Allah forgive, right? We even have, may Allah forgive, but when, even if it's a new Muslim, sometimes even a new Muslim, we feel like, oh no, no, he's not, what the, Muslim nahi hai. you know, like, haqiqi Muslim nahi hai. we feel like he's not a real Muslim. Allah forgive, what are we saying? Subhanallah, this man took the kalima la ilaha illallah, he has no sins. This man is probably the best person to marry off. Lut goes and says to them such a beautiful way, he says, that if you were to become righteous and pious, these are my daughters, hunna taru lakum. Allah subhanahu wa describes this whole scenario in one of the most profound oaths in the Quran. Most profound of oaths in the Quran. Allah ta'ala says, la amruk. O Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah Ta'ala says, I swear by your life, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Ta'ala says, Ibn Abbas says, he said, this is the greatest oath in the Quran. 
Allah did not swear by the sun or the moon, the stars or the earth or anything. Allah swore by the very life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the very life that is known as rahmatan lil alamin, a mercy to all of mankind. Allah is saying, "Oh Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, your whole existence of being such a kind, tender, gentle person, even you would have had trouble with this." Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. La amruk, innam la fi sakratim yamahun. They are completely drunk in their intoxication. They're wandering their drunkenness. This is the way that they said, when Lut says, I will give you them for marriage if you want, they go and say, you know that we don't want this. You know what we came in here for. So immediately at this moment, Lut goes and says such a heartfelt appeal. He says, Lo anna li bikum quwatan, o awi ila ruknin shadid. He says, if only I had the strength against you to do something here. Or if only I had a strong pillar to recline on. Awi, can I take refuge at a strong pillar? The Prophet Muhammad in Hadith Al-Ahmad, he explains this. He says, Rahimallahu Luta. He says, may Allah Ta'ala have mercy on Lut Alayhi Salaam. لَقَدْ آوَى إِلَىٰ رُكْنٍ شَدِيدٍ He has surely taken refuge at a strong pillar. He took, he took refuge إِلَىٰ اللَّهِ Ta'ala. He took refuge in Allah. At that moment when he was at the bottom of the bottom, the lowest of the low, they're in the house about to commit haram right before the very eyes of himself and his daughter in such a terrible position Lut Alayhi Salaam is in. At this moment he said, Allah, I take you as my pillar. If, if there's an earthquake, the strongest pillar you hold on to because why that pillar won't fall. He said, Allah, I'm being devastated right now. But you never crack, you never crumble, Allah. So he grabs onto Allah Ta'ala, he makes dua and says, Ya Allah, protect me at this moment. So then what happens at this moment, the, the, the people jump onto the angels. فَتَمَصْنَا عَيُّنَهُمْ The Quran describes that immediately when they try to jump onto the angels, they, they, sh- they emanate such a light from them that the faces of the people become blinded. One other narration mentions that the whole face was ripped off. They were literally just completely dead. They were dead on the moment, dead on sight right there. Right, so they, were compl- they, they all fall down. And Lut Aysan looks at the guests and he goes and says, you guys aren't, this is not human beings here, right? So then he goes and speaks to them and he says, yes, inna rasul rabbika la yasiru ilayk. Oh Lut, we are the messengers of your Lord. La yasiru ilayk. Allah has heard your dua. They, have, they are not going to, they'll never come near you. They'll never touch a Nabi body. They'll never, not even touch you whatsoever. Oh Lut alayhi salam. At this moment, at this very moment, head out right now with your family. Take everyone and go. Let them, let them all depart now. Because why? He says, because inna mau'idakum subh that the destruction of this community is at morning time. Alaysa subhu bi qareeb om lut. It's it's early morning, right? It's it's very late at night right now. Is the morning not close? Head out right now. So Lut Aysan starts to leave. He starts to take his daughters with them. And the, Lut, the angel said, there's only one person must stay behind. Illam ra'atak, except for your wife. And this is the strong reminder to any Muslims living in America thinking that you can shake hands or sign hands or go kumbaya with such people in LGBT. This is the thing. Illam ra'atak, except for your wife. Innaha musibuha ma'asabahum. Surely whatever is going to hit the people are gonna, is going to hit her too. Because why? Because she supported their actions. You cannot support a person to commit haram. Just be straight. Why are people, subhanAllah, people, may Allah forgive, when people ask us, what do you feel about LGBT and stuff like that? We say it's a moral, condemnable, it's a haram act, it's a sin. Just say it straight. Why is it wrong? People start to say that, uh, yeah, yeah, but it's your political, religious, you know, civil rights, something, something. I don't know what people are trying to say here. Just say it what Islam tells you. They're asking you as a Muslim what Islam says. They're not asking you about what's your legal philosophy about the American Constitution. Right? People start answering constitutionally speaking. Why are you answering about the constitution, brother or sister? You have no reason to answer that. They already know they can do whatever they want. You tell them what Islam says is morally wrong. It's saying that if, you, if you're a person who can practice freely in this country, of course, everyone can be free in this country. But I still will condemn this act. People can drink in this country. Do you tell everyone that it's okay to drink? <laughs> Come on. Like subhanAllah, may Allah forgive us. She will be, she will, it will hit her what it will hit them. And so then Lut Aysam leaves, his, his, his daughters leave with him, and they, they watch from a, a distance. They watch such a hailstorm of, of fire coming down from the sky. They see that from the sky, Allah Ta'ala, فَجَعَلْنَا عَالِيهَا سَافِلَهَا Jibril Aysam comes, and he takes the tip of his wing, he rips out the ground from underneath the qawm, he lifts it up, and he picks it up, and he slams it, the same way they inverted human reality, marriage, everything about what it means to be human. They flipped everything. Mu'tafikat. They completely turned everything around. Allah that took the whole town, He picked it up, and then He slammed it back into the ground. And while this was happening, Allah that made sure that no one was missed from this, ta- from this community. فَجِعَلْنَا This is the 
this is one of the only times where the whole community was destroyed. Not just the people who were muqeem here, but the people who were traveling outside of the town, even they were hit. Allah says, we sent down such a devastating rain. Such a devastating rain. Such a devastating rain. What a terrible rain for those who were warned. Allah that says we send down hijaratan min sijiri mandud. We send down layer upon layer, brick upon brick. This this stone that was completely stacked, musawwamatan inda rabbik. They were marked by Allah. This is what Allah that says. They did such atrocities that Allah that He said, I marked every stone by every name of every individual of the Qomus Sadum. That every single person in that Qom, no one was missed. With every person in that Qom, Allah that had a specific mark for them and He hit every single person. Even the travelers from the area were also struck. Now they were hit with this, this rainstorm, and they hit with an earthquake, and they were flipped completely upside down. And nowadays when you find them, when you find that area that they exist in, it is in the same exact area of the Dead Sea of today. Allah that made an alama ishara for anyone going in that place, that know there was such a filthy people, that even after they died, the water on top of them becomes filthy too. They're such a khabiz people they were. Allah made an ishara. Allah says that any, anyone who's traveling through that area to recognize and note this. Allah gives it for the Quraysh that travel between there and Sham. They go between there and Sham. Allah says, you see this lake here. What was this lake for? It was for the area of Sadum. And now this is a reminder for my son, for everyone. That there are two things that we need to know. Number one and first and foremost, obviously, we live in an area which is so haram and so khabis and so wrong. The best thing you can do is protect your family. And this is the thing, we have not protected our families. We have not done the diligence of our families. We're supposed to be people that care and protect our families. But this is something as Muslims we completely forgot. We forgot to train our kids on Karim al ilaha illa Muhammadur Rasulullah. We trained them on haram. Allah forgive. We trained them on haram, on music, and all these different things that are wrong. And then we expect them to stop on that level. No kids stop on the level of their parents. Kids always go beyond the level of their parents. If you and I did something haram, they'll do even worse things in their, in their later life. As parents, we must protect our children, number one. And number two is that understand that even though we're living in difficult times, if you hold on to your principles and ideals, Allah will save you. Inshallah, Allah will save you like He saved Lut alayhi salam. That is my feeling, my hope in my heart. That the same way Allah has saved Lut alayhi salam, Allah reminds us that you're living in these difficult times, Allah will save it like the community, like He saved Lut alayhi salam. We ask Allah for protection, inshallah, to save all of us, Ya Rabbul Alameen, to become true da'is of this ummah, inshallah, and to become people, inshallah, that can live like Lut alayhi salam, and breathe like Lut alayhi salam, and survive in this community like Lut alayhi salam. We ask Allah for so much tawfiq.